Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope you didn't have to face traffic like I did, and you're all geared up for B20 and then G20, and that you attended D20 last weekend and paid attention to it, because we are going to be focusing on what happened in D20, which is Digital 20, last week, that is digital public infrastructure. So ever since the introduction of Aadhaar in this country, digital public infrastructure has been talked about in different ways, in different terms. Uh, we have had conversations around India stack and different kinds of DPI, such as UPI, India stack, ONDC, NDHM, that's the National Digital Health Mission, uh, ABHA, uh, all are considered DPIs. And now this discussion has reached a crescendo as India presides over the G20 summit this year. So IFF's discussion on DPI couldn't have come at a better time. Just last week, as I mentioned earlier, the G20 digital ministers released an outcome document that focuses on DPI, that's digital public infrastructure, for digital inclusion and innovation. They also proposed a G20 framework for systems of DPI for purposes of governance. So it's against this background that we are going to have the discussion today, where we'll focus on what exactly DPI is, what it isn't, why is India talking about it so much, and how DPI should be governed. So without further ado, uh, Rohit, actually, I'll begin with you. What does DPI mean? And what does it not mean? Is it like a catch-all term for everything under the sun? I think uh, you started with the most controversial question with me, because uh, what DPI is and isn't, I think, it I think nobody is really clear about completely. Uh, so we started working on the digital public infrastructure about two, three years ago. And you know, one of the first things we decided to do was to see, understand what DPI is, because the term public in DPI, you know, that really defines the whole thing. Um, but we were at a loss because when you look at the economic definition of what is public, which is non-exclusion, uh, you know, something that cannot you cannot exclude users from or non-rivalrous, DPI doesn't fit that criteria neatly. Uh, when you look at the legal definition, uh, where it talks about accountability and who controls it, it doesn't fit that definition uh, neatly. So I think we spent a considerable amount of time trying to come up with a definition. And I think Mansi's team finally did a really good job. So I'm going to leave her to sort of come in on that. But to me, I think, uh, and even the G20 document recognizes that, that it's an evolving concept. Everybody doesn't agree on what it is, uh, what it means. But I think uh, the public term could be understood from a more economic lens in the sense that, you know, there are positive externalities to DPIs. When you build a digital public infrastructure, it facilitates the economic activity or it allows more things to happen. And, you know, in economics, whenever you have a public uh, good that has positive externalities, uh, it means that market may not be investing enough in it. And you usually need the government to step in and provide for that. And I think that's where, this is what signifies the term public, that there is a public role in getting that ecosystem going by facilitating that investment. And I'll give one example, and, and I know you have us on clock, uh, <laughs> that you know when, for instance, demonetization happened, uh, at that time, Paytm had completely uh, occupied, you know, captured the market. But if the government or the regulator had not forced interoperability of wallets or, you know, probably didn't come up with UPI later, that network effect would have not led to the ecosystem. I mean, there are still problems with the ecosystem, but it wouldn't have opened it up. Uh, so I think it is not in the private player's interest to build such infrastructure that allows others to come on top of it. And that's where the public or the government needs to come in. So I, I don't know if that helps. So to summarize, you're saying that the public part is where the government takes a is playing a role. Is playing, is playing a, role a role to facilitate the for a larger public good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll come to you and ask you what's the difference between DPI and DPG, which is digital public goods. Then and so that, that sort of absolutely. Uh, so taking on from what Rohit said, so when the public two publics, he said one was the economic public, which is non-excludable, non-rivalrous, and the other public, which is government ownership and government accountability. There's a third public that technologists use, which is like open data, open source, which is what digital public goods are, which are the building blocks, right? So which is your open data, your open APIs, open protocols, and the engineers in the room can talk more about it. But from how we understood as uh, when we were trying to figure out this whole digital public ecosystem was that DPGs are essentially the building blocks on which these networks and shared systems are created, which is what we call 
digital public infrastructure. So to give you an example, which might sound familiar, is that MOSIP, for instance, is your DPG, and Aadhaar uh, is your DPI. Or uh, for someone who's more familiar with ONDC, then Beckon is your DPG, and ONDC is your DPI. So there is a, there is a building block and then there is an interoperable shared platform network, whatever you might want to call it, that facilitates, or a rail that facilitates services and players to interact, engage, and skill services. I think that's useful. Also, the example that you took, which is of MOSIP and Aadhaar, MOSIP being the digital public good. Yes. MOSIP, for people who might not know, is the identity program that was launched by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> yep. Triple, a triple in conjunction with uh, Triple ID Bangalore. Yeah, and it's interesting because Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation released a sorry released a blog post about this. I think it's, it's working. Yeah. Uh, they released a blog post about DPI on August 16, and on August 19, the document came out. And if you look at the document and you compare it to that detailed blog post, uh, it's almost like the skeleton is the same. So they probably had the same index, and then they filled out the paragraphs. That's what it seemed like to me. So, uh, so you said MOSIP is DPG, the good, and Be uh, sorry, Aadhaar Aadhaar would the be DPI. the DPI. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So one of the definition, one of the phrases that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation article used was, uh, if I'm not wrong, um, rails on which DPI is the rails on which everything operates, and that's something that the G20 Sherpa, Mr. Amitabh Kant, has also mentioned. Yeah n number of times. That, so what does that mean? I mean, how I would interpret it is more as you interpret infrastructure. So what does infrastructure do? Rails is like an enabler. Mm -hmm. So that's how you would think. So given that, so while public is that word, infrastructure is the other word. What does infrastructure really mean here? And if you want to draw a parallel to the physical world of infrastructure, what it does is to create an enabler for other industries to prosper, grow, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the rails, how I am reading the rails is like an enabler for more services, for more players, for the ecosystem to evolve. So before I come to Nikhil about his views on what DPI is, Rohit, I want to come back to you about what this infrastructure entails actually. Because when we think of, say, bridges or roads, even when we think of the internet as infrastructure, we know it's telcos, we know it's uh, deep sea fiber cables, et cetera, et cetera. What is infrastructure here? And just to put it in context, I'll read out the definition that the outcome document has. It says DPI is described as a set of shared digital systems that should be secure and interoperable and can be built on open standards and specifications to deliver and provide equitable access to public and or private services at societal scale and are governed by applicable legal frameworks and enabling rules to drive development, inclusion, innovation, trust, and competition and respect human rights and fundamental freedoms. So, I mean, when I read Is that, that a word salad? Yeah, when I, uh, when I read that definition, I had to read it thrice uh, because it's, I think it's trying to do too much. Uh, uh, but, you know, as Mansi said, it's, it's, it's basically, you know, think of something that is sort of intermediating the rest of the players in the ecosystem. We hate the term intermediary okay, here. Yeah. <laughs> So basically something that allows, uh, and so when you have protocols which say that, let's say you create certain set of standards, so everybody is following that set of standards, so therefore, you know, data exchange will become easier. And then when you have something in the middle, I'm not using the word intermediating, uh, that allows that data then to be exchanged, then all of those different components will form the digital public infrastructure. So basically I think it's allowing different elements of the ecosystem to connect. So it could include protocols that allow that, it could include uh, you know, softwares, APIs, open APIs, registries uh, that allow all of that to happen. So that's how you would, you can probably understand it. So let's say there's a road that is in the physical world that's going in and there are businesses on the side and they all use the road to connect to each other. So a sort of a digital parallel of that, uh, if I may, I don't know if that explains it. Do it does to some extent. It is, a, it, it's a complicated concept and also one that is evolving, right? So, you know, the definition that they gave in the outcome document, unfortunately, I think does a little bit of disservice to the whole idea because it just, I think more because of the way it's written and not because of what it's trying to convey, uh, which is to say that countries, sectors can adapt to DPI in varying ways, but with the objective of doing something for the public at scale, to have something interoperable means to 
with certain uh, with certain thresholds allowing as much participation as possible and making it as open as possible which does not mean that it has to be completely open all open standards only by the government so they don't have those restrictions it's flexible in that sense depending on which sector you want to apply to which country context and what objective you're trying to achieve so i think that the writing or that paragraph uh, in the in the g20 summary document unfortunately i think is a disservice to that idea got it so we'll come back to this discussion around what different dpis are and how they should be regulated or governed nikhil i want to come to you because i know you have a very different idea of what dpi is and you have very many questions about it actually i've been trying to figure out what dpi is uh, simply so the definition that we have of dpi here is complex and it really is complex because it's trying to position existing systems that are functioning as something as they are not so it's com it's complicated because it can be anything and everything you want it to be because there's so many variations <clears throat> of what we have here that it'll fit so for example if you take a look at this definition mastercard and visa will fit that definition in all probability whatsapp will fit that definition in all probability google will fit that definition so everything under the sun that is on the internet is basically digital public infrastructure except it doesn't get recognized by the government of india as digital public infrastructure but upi does so uh, why i was exploring the definition of digital public infrastructure was because of a debate as having uh, both internally in media nama and our editorial team because this word public is very really curious here um and we found a kind of a dissonance in the in that use of the word public because traditionally the uh, the word public essentially refers to something which is government run government owned and yet um and you know there is this this conception that for example npci or ondc are government run or government owned but then npci went all the way to india's chief information commissioner and argued that it is not under rti because it's a private entity and if you look at the shareholding structure of npci it's owned entirely by banks there is of course as following the vatel committee report a, uh, a proposal to expand it to other entities including wallets but it's entirely privately owned if you go to ondc's website take a look at the shareholding structure ondc is entirely privately owned now you know there are a couple of things in terms of positive externalities that rohit mentioned um i'll give you an example i was sitting with a friend of mine who was running a upi company uh vc funded uh, and uh, <clears throat> this was around uh, post demonetization i was uh, just at, like um, january 2017 i remember and he's like we're probably going to have to shut down and i'm like why he says the government of india has just announced backing for uh, bhim upi so you had a entity called npci which created a an app called bhim which the government of india announced uh, public funds for promoting the bhim app if you remember the prime minister i think on december 29th had announced it Uh, in his speech post demonetization and uh, so he's saying my investors are coming to me and saying that why will we fund a company that's going to com compete with the consolidated fund of india so up? so what is the positive outcome hmm. hear me out right even today how many upi companies are there and how many are dominant you have four dominant players three dominant players in fact mostly two phone pay yeah. google pay and a distant third now is paytm which means that there is literally no competition to the extent that npci is now saying that they will regulate competition in upi so that uh, no entity has more than 30% market share uh whereas the whole purpose of upi was to break the hegemony of mastercard and visa so you've moved from a duopoly of mastercard and visa to a monopoly of npci on top of which you have an uh, a duopoly of phone pay and and google pay so you know the problem is when the government starts trying to mess around with existing markets so let's instill competition it geoded fantastically well to bring competition into telecom where there was a cartel in operation but 
the when the government of india starts trying to mess around with this uh, my question is who benefits even when you look at you know there's a couple of phrases that were used open data open source open api open protocols nikhil nikhil you uh, i'm going to the definition of public right yeah yeah open we're data, going open, to come to that we're going where to is come open to data that. Where is open data? Where is open source? We are going to come to that. We are going source? to come to that when we talk about governance. Give it a minute. Okay. Give it five minutes. So, um, yeah, we'll come to the discussion around openness. Who owns right. it? So, can I just go a little bit into history about the politics of how this came about? Right. The Indian government for the longest time has had China in view. Uh, we liked the way Union Pay was set up uh, in China to get Mastercard and Visa out of the game. Right. Uh, i remember a, a, a meeting a closed door meeting that i was in um where there was a fear that just the way trump has basically uh, stopped android updates in china uh, and therefore that creates a security issue there what if the us stops mastercard and visa in india and that basically puts our entire financial ecosystem at risk right and so UPI was was born out of the failure of Rupee to compete with Mastercard and Visa, but you've essentially, like I said earlier, you've moved to from a oligopoly or you've moved from a duopoly to now a monopoly, which means that the entire ecosystem operates on the whims of a private entity called NPCI, uh, which can choose who it allows to launch a UPI app first. My question. if it is open standards or open protocol or whatever why was phone pay the first entity to launch nikhil we'll come how to is that public questions. we'll come to these questions you raised a very interesting point about the china angle theek hai i'm not done yet but go on yeah but i'm the moderator so what i say uh, is the rule so yeah uh, but uh, so nikhil raised a very interesting point about the china angle and this is something i mentioned in my introduction as well that we are going to look at why is india pushing for dpi and that to at a global level where you have all the ministers talking about uh, where you have all the different countries talking about it releasing different documents so is this an answer to china's belt and road initiative is this uh, india leveraging its own soft power mansi if you want to go first um i I, I don't think uh, this is uh, this is definitely India trying to showcase to the world that we have leapfrogged and we've leapfrogged on our own, and it's true. Like you know, I mean, this is success we can't deny. I mean, there are lots of problems with um, Aadhaar or UPI or it not having manifested in the way that one would have liked it to. Uh, but you cannot take away from the value that it has added. you know whether it is in terms of welfare distribution whether it is in the context of financial inclusion whether it is in terms of efficiency i mean there are multiple goods and multiple bads so it i i think it's india's opportunity as every country is to sort of showcase to the world what it has done and created on its own whether or not i think the belt and road initiative of china is is different in the sense that there is actual stake that china has put in other countries in terms of really giving the money uh, to countries which i don't think through uh, aadhar uh, or mosip uh, india has done or will be able to do what so. about india stack because so i think it's it's more from what i know know that it's not as if like aadhar is going to get transported to another country right they can share the technology it's an it, to whatever extent and does so india so. earn out of it like they they may or they may choose to, uh, they may choose to they may not choose to but it's i think to me it's more like soft power it's more like Okay, now like a developed country, we will do technology transfer. Oh, so far, we, we will bestow this gift yes, of DPI yes. on you because we are so gracious. Yeah, but I awesome. think we can say it in a nice way. It's an achievement. I I would think like, yeah, like I said, there are problems with it, but it isn't half bad that India for the first time has something to offer to the world in terms of technology. Like it's, <laughs> it's not so Fair. hard to accept that. Fair, yeah. Rohit. whatever you want to add that and also the question what nikhil was talking about like coming up with an alternative to visa or mastercard uh, this is what china began with even in the committee report the 2021 committee report on the then personal data protection bill the joint parliamentary committee had said that we need to set up our own alternate payment system so is this dpi push a way to have atmanirbhar everything and atmanirbhar global things 
I mean, it could be both, and I would actually agree with Mansi that there is a lot of soft power uh, element at play here. Uh, in fact, uh, we had briefly been in conversations with Mosip, and we were trying to understand their model. And Mosip has been trying to sort of speak to different countries, and Mosip is open source modular. So what they have been trying to do is that reach out to different companies, uh, countries, governments, and try and see if they are trying to come up with a digital identity system. They're basically offering their uh, modular blocks, which can be customized so that that country is able to sort of build its system faster. I don't think, I mean, unless my understanding is incorrect, I don't think this you get any business out of it per se, apart from, you know, soft power that you generate in terms of relationships, etc., which I think in, in global diplomacy does matter. Uh, otherwise, also, it is, and, you know, you're completely right, I think there was a parliamentary standing committee report which said that you need a system or other than SWIFT, for instance, uh, because right now SWIFT is being used to put, say, <laughs> sanctions on Russia, and eventually if something like that happens and we end up taking a position which is not something that, you know, the big forces agree, it could be a problem. So the fact that India came up with UPI and is now trying to get other countries to adopt that, you know, parallel chain, it could be doing that as well. But you know, you have this technology, you have this infrastructure, there is no harm in using it for multiple reasons, multiple ways. And I think domestically, it, it has helped us. And just to add to what, um, uh, you know, Mansi's point, I, I don't know if that's a question later. But you know, there has been significant domestic benefits of UPA. So I, not just UPA, but you know, all the digital public infrastructure. So the push may have had both domestic components as well as foreign components. And so yeah, I mean, I, I would stop that unless you want to add, add a quick point. Like, very yeah, quick yeah. thing, like uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Atman Nirbhar. So if you look at uh, the UPI, it doesn't just have domestic firms. So, you know, in fact, we go beyond UPI and look at other DPI as well, like ONDC, which yeah. <laughs> there's not as the reason we have to sort of stick to unfortunately. What about Aadhaar? So Aadhaar is a digital identity. I don't, so this comes to the question of different types of DPI, right? Yeah. So Aadhaar is not at all comparable. Aadhaar is a very like government centric, citizen centric Because DPI. the outcome document as well as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation blog post, which has become like the cornerstone for yeah. this debate, they identify three core functions of DPI. Right. Identification, payments, and uh, data sharing with consent. Or so I think I'll, concept. if yeah. you can give me like yeah, five yeah, seconds, there are like, I think if you can broaden that a little bit and say uh, digital identity. So one is the identity. The second is integration of services. So that, so that could be payment services. It could be health services. It could be education services. So integration. So I wouldn't call it payments. I mean, India has developed payments and payments is foundational because it's cuts across all sectors, but essentially the DPI we're talking about is integration of services. So getting all health service providers together, getting skilled service providers together, getting payment service providers. So it's an integration function that the DPI solve. And the third is related to data exchange. So how can you enable data exchange across different, um, in, in a consent or, or in a safe or protected uh, format? So I wouldn't say that, you know, we shouldn't think of it as identity payments and data exchange, even if I think we should think of it as identity integration of services and data exchange. I, th I think it's a slightly more broader understanding of DPIs. Got it. Uh, just as you hand it over to Nikhil, the integration piece is the bit that is trying to hit at uh, monopolies. So, see, the deal is that, and we can come back to this later, the fact that the MasterCard Visa monopoly was not broken and instead we ended up creating a different monopoly, so to speak. One is the institutional design and, you know, whether there is accountability and governance and being who's being let in, when are they being let in, do they get the first mover advantage, that is one. But the second also is I think there has to be a recognition that tech by itself has the problem of network effects. That if you start becoming bigger, you are likely to become even bigger. So this is also humbling in a way to understand that no matter what you do in the middle, you may not be able to completely fix it. So you have to think about different ways, but DPI is definitely is also an attempt to hit at the network effects that come with Got it. tech. One sec, Mansi, Mansi. Oh, wait, 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 don't give it to Nikhil yet. Because for Nikhil, I have like a barrage of questions. No, you aren't being silenced. I have like a I list. I, of... I'm wondering if I am. No, 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 no. We are getting into governance. But first, I wanted to ask Mansi and Rohit about, explain ONDC to me as quickly as possible. And who owns what? Who is acting as a gatekeeper? And then I'll go to Nikhil about uh, governance. That when you have ONDC, what is ONDC? Is it a set of protocols? If it's just, yeah. yeah, let's do yes, no's here. So, oh. No, I think wait, that's wait, a wait. limited. No ad-libbing. Uh, so I, the, the other thing that 
can I just go back to what yeah, Roy yeah, said yeah. about the, I'll come to ONDC, I yeah. promise in like 10 seconds, but what I wanted to say about the network effects thing is that it's actually true. And that is why I think when we are implementing a DPI, hoping to solve for the competition problem, we need to be a bit aware about how the market will react. And in India, unfortunately, the banks didn't step up. The reason we see so much concentration is the for whatever reasons the banks didn't, whether it was a, a merchant discount rate policy because they were lazy, I don't know what it was, there could be a thousand reasons. But if you look at other countries, like for example, uh, PIX in Brazil, which has exactly the same system, uh, there the banks are participating a lot more. So it, and on the other hand, where you look at countries like China or US, and if you look where there are no DPIs, there also the market is concentrated with three or four players. So it's not Nikhil a DPI problem. would argue problem. that both China and US have DPIs. And we'll no, not, it's not like in, in the DPI Master format Card for payments. No, they are not DPIs. DPI. No, I don't know. Okay. Anyway, okay, anyway okay, okay. let's not we'll go move there. Forward I'll answer the ONDC question. Questions. Because so that, that would also help at least me understand what is the DPI part, who's controlling it, who's the gatekeeper. So what so is I o don't think there is a gatekeeper to the extent that obviously there are some... Uh, do's and don'ts on you know whether or not somebody is permitted into the ecosystem that is the license that is associated so even if somebody is joining the upi uh, network so let's it's the commerce e-commerce network for ondc is the e-commerce network for what upi is to payment companies and uh, and it's complicated in the way that they call one side a buyer side and one side a seller side which is basically one that uh, lets consumers uh, uh, lets consumers interact and the others where your vendors uh, join the network but essentially it is all buyers and sellers of all types of services that come onto the network and i as a just so today if i had to uh, use a, use upi i'll go to google pay go to the upi option and pay similarly if i had to go to ondc i'll go either to the paytm network or who, whichever other com company <coughs> is on the ondc network and then buy and sell but while buying and selling i'm seeing a broader range of products and sellers versus just paytm's onboarded uh, so ecosystem so what incentive does paytm have to onboard say my vegetable vendor because that's so the that, that's that the is, dream of ONDC, right? That even my vegetable vendor can now sell me vegetables through the ONDC network. But he or she doesn't have the technical know-how or the economic or, or social or cultural advantage in life to actually be able to get onto that network. So that's the so, compulsion of the ONDC. And if Paytm then, sees a commercial interest in doing that, whether it is scale, whether it is access to more data, that is a... So if... That is the reason why some have chosen to stay, uh, get onto the network and some have chosen not to get onto the network. So for example, if uh, phone pay or pin code, I guess hmm. that's the new flip card thing. So why have they gotten onto the network? Is probably because they're looking for the scale effects that they may not be able to get if they're outside the ONDC network. So those commercial considerations depend from company to company. But if they're on the network and if it is being governed properly and if everything is running as per design, then they have to by design uh, of ONDC on board everyone there is to. Uh, Rohit, then I'm going 10 to seconds. I'm thing. looking at my yes. watch. Yeah. No, 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 I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. Very quickly. Uh, so I'm just to explain. So I think ONDC stated purpose was then monopoly bid. Hmm. Like there are big e-commerce players. When you search on say hypothetically uh, Flipkart, Amazon, whatever, you only see uh, buyers that uh, sellers that have been onboarded by them. But now through an intermediate uh, system in between if you search on Amazon you can see things listed on Paytm and you can choose a different delivery partner uh, to sort of do it so basically they're unpacking the whole thing they're trying to hit at the network effects and that is really I mean whatever the design in between but that's really what what is being done Nikhil I'll come to you all your points and also if you can then I, I have a response to yeah yeah respond to all of them uh, <laughs> but also specifically uh, also also not like uh, what Mansi was talking about, that Paytm is letting uh, sellers in. So who is the one governing who is let in, who's let out, and who's sitting on top of, say, PIN code, Paytm, and uh, uh, the third one you mentioned, I think, was Google Pay? Actually pulled a story yeah. out August 27th, to th uh, April 27th, 2023. ONDC CEO uh, Thampi Koshi says, that ONDC will continuously evaluate the performance and commitment of the platforms joining it for their contribution towards the progress of the network, story in economic times. So ONDC is deciding who gets on the platform and how they uh, behave. Uh, there was an, also an interview where Koshi said that 
they were unhappy about a particular platform launching a separate app for ONDC and that they would prefer it if it would be integrated into the existing payments app. So ONDC becomes the so Amazon. So ONDC is your gatekeeper. Hmm. In the same way that NPCI is a gatekeeper. So if you are looking now, anyone who understands open source, open protocols, these are built around the idea of having no gatekeepers. So let's not use phrases loosely when it comes to what we are seeing with this so-called digital public infrastructure, which is neither infrastructure nor is it public. Um, and that's my point, right? Uh, when, when you look at the system setup, I mean, even when you look at it from a privacy standpoint, from a personal perspective, right? We filed an RTI uh, with the Ministry of Civil Aviation on uh, how many people have enrolled for Digiatra. And they said, we have no information because this, this facial information is being collected by a private entity called Digi Yatra Foundation. So these are all private non-profit organizations. Where is this public in any shape or form? Uh, and where is the accountability here for... N so you can talk about governance, right? It's up to them. Maybe they're listening to government diktat, but diktats, but the government has no locus to actually direct them to do something. Where they have the only success story you have for this so-called digital public infrastructure, and Aadhaar is a good rather than infrastructure, so let's keep that out. And that was anyway forced down our throats. Uh, is UPI? That's why everyone keeps talking about UPI. They badly need another success story, simply because everything has failed. That's why Digiatra is being pushed at us. And you have seven, six gates at, a, at an airport for Digi Yatra and one and a longer queue for everything else. Why? Because they need it to succeed. India has got only one success story. They had a demonetization moment in health with COVID. They went all out, all guns blazing. There were multiple workshops which we attended where they were looking at doctor registries, etc. NHA has failed to roll out uh, the, the, the health stack. So there's only one success story, which is why... I don't mind anyone talking about UPI because that's the only thing worth talking about in this digital public infrastructure, right? And that's why the conversation keeps going back to that. It's not just that it's the most evolved. It's the fact that it's a highly tightly regulated ecosystem. You have had the Reserve Bank of India, for example, force, uh, like close down recurring payments on, on credit cards uh, at just months after UPI's recurring payments guidelines came in. You have had tokenization forced where international payments are failing all across just so that people in India using credit cards are, are basically have to go through an inconvenience and they may use a more convenient platform like U UPI. So all policy in this country has moved towards making a private platform owned by a private entity called NPCI succeed. And you can see it like I have, you just look at the way if you start connecting the dots on what's happening, they connect. You bring up a very interesting point, which is about how the government is actively intervening to make a private entity successful so that the larger narrative of DPI is also proven to be a success. No, no. Taxpayer money going to fund a private app by, by, uh, called Bheem. Taxpayer money going into it. Yeah. So, I get that. And it also... Uh, and also about who's, you mentioned that the government has no locus to be actually able to intervene, say, with UPI. I think that's Except in UPI, with the Payments and Settlements Act, mm -hmm. uh, you basically had the Revenue Secretary kill the UPI ecosystem by imposing zero MDR. And for those who don't know, MDR is merchant discounted. It's the pennies that uh, a merchant basically has to pay to an, in, uh, the payment rails for enabling or accepting a payment using UPI or a credit card. So they made zero MDR for, uh, uh, f for UPI. As a result, the business model of multiple entities went down the drain, which is why you only have PhonePay, which is owned by Walmart, and Google GPay, which is owned by Google Pay, dominating the space. So hey, guess what? If you wanted Indian companies in this game, you just kill their business model. So it's so basically you move from Mastercard and Visa to phone pay and Google Pay. Right, Nikhil, can you? Have How things changed? Oh, my time is up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 
I give you like five minutes at a stretch to say, to speak, and then I go back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Uh, two two points, Nikhil. Uh, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with the part of lack of accountability, but I also want to say that uh, just you know, an aside that being under the RTI Act still doesn't solve the problems. You remember in tokenization, we had filed an RTI with the RBI and we got zero answers. So uh, so that's Story possible. Story of all our lives with RTI now. Now it's worse with DPDP, but okay, yeah. that's a different discussion. Uh, but, uh, but to the point, you know, the, the risk is real. In fact, uh, Smriti Parshira, who's, who, uh, who I think was initially with the NIPFP, had recently published a paper about the, what is called the alt big tech, saying that uh, you wanted, uh, you know, one of the stated goals of digital public infrastructure that were coming in, but what you were essentially done is also that you've concentrated a lot of power in these not-for-profit Section 8 companies that are in charge of NCPI, uh, ONDC, etc. And they are not as transparent and they also have significant, uh, they can play a significant role in directing the ecosystem in a certain direction. For instance, if NPCI says that MDR has, or you know, agrees with the government or whatever, that N MDR has to be zero, then people who can't discount, like make money in the, uh, or can't wait to make money, they will be left out of the ecosystem. So the ecosystem will start growing in a certain direction. But there are also others who say that, a, you know, a zero one approach, a way to look at it is not right. Because when you put the level of public scrutiny or accountability that comes with public institutions, you also reduce agility you also reduce the pace of innovation. That is exactly why there isn't as much innovation that happens in the public sector. Innovation happens in the marketplace. So perhaps a balance is needed wherein uh, there is strong government oversight and accountability and transparency. But to what extent do you force it? Should it vary issue by issue? Should it vary service by service? That's something that you should think at without completely bucketing things between zero and one. That's something that I want to ask Mansi about that when we're talking about different possible services through DPI, so one is you have payments through UPI, uh, you have e-commerce through ONDC, you have health through NDHM, uh, National Digital Health Mission and ABHA and non-consensual processing of health data and all of that. So there, uh, do you think government should have a varying amount of role depending on the service? So for instance, for health, Government should have greater interventions, greater control over the market or non-market as the case may be versus e-commerce because the stakes are arguably lower in terms of impact on actual health of physical humans. Yeah, I, I think so. Absolutely. In fact, I, to start the governance conversation, I think the first thing that needs to be done for DPI, at least in the ones that have reached uh, certain degrees of scale is definitely to do some impact assessments, right? To see what is going Don't on. Don't we want that for everything? Yeah, I mean, we'd want that for everything, but for DPIs, given the scale at which, uh, you know, they are growing and the number of people that they impact and for economic structures that are being, uh, ch that are changing, the linkages, etc. it's only fair that, you know, we, we do an impact assessment to understand where things are going well and where things are not going well. Instead of, you know, I, I think we've been very reactive for whatever reasons with the governance system, okay, this is like what Nikhil was saying that, uh, you know, we were not anticipating that this is going to be turn, going to turn out to be uh, um, an oligopolistic market structure in the UPI. We've opened everything out, but there's still three players. So, and then you decided, oh God, we should do market cap. So if we can have a more proactive approach, just impact assessments, forget, you know, who's sitting where, but in terms Would that of, include a sandbox approach? So sandbox is something, you know, that you do before you roll out really to, to at scale. Oh, and so we that, are not in the business of doing that. <laughs> so, I mean, to be fair, RBI is trying to do that with a lot of fintech companies. And it's also an idea that governments want to uh, adopt. But I mean, there are lots of problems, you know, it's not uh, as, as we all know. But I think with DPS, it, it genuinely... If uh, even with the case of account aggregators, I think now it's a good time, you know, because whatever there are, whatever lacks of loans or crores, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it has reached a scale where you can, you know, you know sort of start looking at it. In terms of your direct question on what degree of control, I think they will sort of resonate with the laws that already exist, you know, where uh, wherever the, the harms remain the same, right? And... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I'll have to cut you yeah, it's off. It's okay, it's okay. So I, I just, agree with you. Like, basically, yeah, like yeah so talk. we'll just take two minutes, not per person, two minutes total. Mm -hmm. Final remarks and what goes ahead. 30 seconds to Euro here, 30 seconds to Mansi, and then one minute to Nikhil. I'll come to him at the end so that I can be like, audience time now. Okay, I, I think... Uh, 
my remarks are going to be short only i i think the the in terms of what what we should sort of look for prepare for in the future i think first to not see it as a silver bullet i think uh, you know governments and you know general media have a tendency to jump onto things and they are uh, they're uh, jump onto the bandwagon and i think suddenly every newspaper you open everything you open even the civil society everybody is talking about creating dps because that's going to be potentially the silver bullet that solves everything i don't think it is that but it is definitely an important lever uh, but i also think it is important to be cognizant of the risks that come with concentrating or creating these market actors that have a lot of power and i think it is also useful to build contingencies which is what the rbi was potentially trying to do by saying that i am going to create a parallel npci so that there is competition at the npci level it hasn't nothing has happened yet but remains to be seen manthi i could actually just echo what he's saying we we don't want to uh, go digital when there's no need to go digital and we need to also see uh, to see where it's working so the bank the you know the, the where do we maximize benefits with this infrastructure and all of that will come with you know some sort of evidence building some sort of analysis of what is going on risk assessment yeah but i but this uh, zero one you know this binary view on matters is i don't think that's the right approach that there, there is definitely uh, there's definitely gain and there's so the, the the cost benefit analysis is important i don't think it's like all bad all good so we should just be patient and try to do that it's on a spectrum nikhil so i love upi by the way uh, so uh, no i do seriously uh, i think so i have two angles to look at number one uh, let's look at from from a centralization of power perspective what is happening with the rolling out of these infrastructures or these mechanisms is that there is central government control coming over all sorts of economic activity whether it is in health its education its payments uh, its uh, its its facial data its voice uh, and the central and also with gst the same uh, has been used to transfer tax tax money away from states and give that control to the center right so all of this infrastructure that we're seeing is leading to a centralization of power with the central government which is not good for the federal structure of this country um what it also means as an entrepreneur is that any every single ecosystem that has digital public infrastructure so to say i may not have the freedom to run the business the way i want to run it uh, it won't be depend on market forces but there will be some babu in the revenue uh, uh, in in let's say the ministry of finance who will impose zero mdr and kill my entire business model these kind of interventions will be possible directly from the central government and market forces will be impacted so it affects competition in the market affects freedom to do whatever business you want within the regulatory ambit because there is going to be extensive regulatory intervention through the tech controls which are being imposed through privately owned non profit companies across the board from a business perspective the angle that we really sort of focused on and we haven't is privacy all of this generates a vast amount of digital data all of the data is getting aggregated with individual companies the silos between entities is being broken it can be centralized given the data protection bill what will happen is every company that's on this these systems will become uh, essentially it's a privatization of surveillance any entity that collects your data the government of india can collect data from them all of this will feed into natgrid and lead to massive amount of surveillance in real time remember natgrid phase 3 was 1600 public and private databases over 1600 right all aggregated on a dashboard real time at the same time you have an account aggregator framework you have this uh, consent manager called depa which will enable uh, the reduction of friction in transferring of data as we know in payments friction is an important mechanism for prevention uh, of of protection you remove friction in data transfers you basically have a privacy nightmare happening so i would say that this is that beyond everything we've discussed we need to really look at this from a data like india is a data rich country everyone will get everyone will get everyone else's data as the way it's going to go thanks nikhil thank you for bringing up the question of privacy because privacy supreme that's why i did yeah yeah really that was really subtly done but uh, but subtlety is the uh, tone of the day but questions oh wow yes sir you in black kurta yes not a question but just some clarity hmm. on 
the first thing which you spoke about digital public goods and digital public infrastructure, what are they? Okay, this is factual. Digital public goods was the first set of terms those initiators wanted to use to describe these things, mechanisms as uh, uh, Nikhil put it. And they were told that it is conceptually wrong because they are not public goods. So you can't go to anybody else who's a, I mean, who's half an economist and tell them it's public goods. They'll laugh at you, right? They said, look, you need a different term. And the different term which was suggested was digital public services infrastructure. Because which is accurate, because this is digital infrastructure to deliver public services. Could be health, whatever, uh, identity, payments, uh, welfare, and so on. So some marketing guy must have decided that, look, digital public services infrastructure is a mouthful. So let's drop services. And they call it digital public infrastructure. It was probably BCG. Yeah, so whoever it is. Right? So, so, so the, that's the history of why it's called digital public infrastructure. So for us now to go and forensically look at it and try to derive meaning into it, we'll run into difficulties because that's how the thing evolved. The second point is, as to the G20's definition of digital public infrastructure, I request all sane people not to look at it. Because it's, it's just meaningless bullshit, right? Because that's what all government... The Journalists in the room make note. This is an on-the-record conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel yeah. free to quote him. Have, this is perfect. Yeah, you can quote. I mean, I have nothing to... Uh, I mean, this I'm is kidding, public I'm information, kidding. right? Yeah. But multilateral uh, organizations and international treaties are a bunch of bullshit, right? So you can, you can avoid this analytically meaningless. But the only analytically rigorous thing we could look at it is digital public infrastructure is digital infrastructure which is used to deliver public services, right? What those public services are, it changes according to time, but don't don't worry about, don't get into uh, the semantics of others. And, and who delivers those services? No, no, it's on. I'm saying in the context of ONDC, that public service element may not directly, I think because the term has been used very loosely now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, uh, the lady in yellow. Yeah. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Evita. I work on housing and caste, but that is just to give you the introduction here. But uh, some of the things that you guys have been talking about, obviously, some things have gone up to the head, for sure. Because some things have to see again. Because to come back to the ecosystem and also to come back to what Sir was talking about, the G20 document, it's just not G20, any document that, that is coming out, it's all like that. They have just got the right words to fool us. Recently, you must all have seen, we were doing a parallel, this thing of V20 and how the police actually kind of stopped us from doing that event, so just kind of put on, putting that on record. But ecosystem, ke mein, if I come back, when the UPI was how I see and kind of resonate with what of some of the things that Nikhil was saying, to me, it was forced down on me is how I see it. Reason being that I was in Bangalore and this happened right after the demonetization that we were seeing. In Bangalore, I remember that cigarette or uh, sutta or cigarette ke liye bhi jane ke liye, a time came where they wanted us to do UPI payments. Banks kaam nahi kar rahe the. Bank ke paas jao to 2000 ka note nikalta tha. 2000 ka note nikalta tha to koi chutta dene ke liye ready nahi. Ek samane pe jab hum paida huye hain jahan pe 5 rupay aur 10 rupay ki kiemat hoti thi. Abhi apne batu hai, 5 rupay bhi nahi milta hai. वो पांच रुपए देने के चक्कर में अभी हम लोग एक रेजिस्ट बहुत करने के बाद देन वन हैड टू कम ऑन यूपीआई सो दैट वन कुड एक्चुअली पे दैट फाइव रुपीस और दैट टेन रुपीस और दैट फिफ्टीन रुपीस टू बाय सिगरेट एंड इट्स सो स्ट्रेंज इन बैक लाइक आई डोंट नो व्हाई द बैंक्स वर नॉट वर्किंग सम ऑफ द बैंक्स वर गेटिंग क्लोज if we actually talk about connecting the dots, to me, it is not happening in some silo. It had some, it, it had its own way of, while you guys are talking about ecosystem and much more in the background behind the scene, behind the screen in the sense, to me, this was what was happening to make sure that you actually get into the app and you do not have a way and one, and you are trapped then and then you are just used to it. So, so yeah. So, so it's oxygen through coercion. That's right. how I saw it. Coercion by design. Got it. Got yeah, it. Somebody wants to write something. Yeah, uh, Nikhil, I think you do. No, I, I mean, just a little fact. Uh, Startup India, Jan 29th, 2016. Uh, payments panel right at the end, they called for cashless India. Just look it up. That, they, that was later that your demonetization happened. Uh, correlation is not causation. I'm not inferring anything. 
Okay, I will just request audience members to keep it brief to pull a Mansi and a Rohit and not a Nikhil so that everyone can. I barely got any time. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, Kodali and then the gentleman in white in front of Pratik. Hi, uh, I've been tracking all of this since they were called National Information Utilities. I don't know how many have heard of it, but there was one guy who went into the government and said GSTN is a National Information Utility. Somehow we don't talk about it because of, again, it failed massively, if you look at it from a federal perspective. Also, uh, I wanted to bring this BBPS. I don't know how many of you here even know this exists. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's working. working out. We hear about UPI, right? But if you look at BBPS, it was taken from Build Desk. You looked at a market idea, you nationalized it. Okay? Every single digital public infrastructure was nationalization of market ideas at some level. In fact, I don't even want to call it. Mic's off. Mic's off. That's fine. No, no, it's recording. Mic's off. One second. Yeah. Kodali. Yeah. In fact, I don't want to call it uh, nationalization of market ideas. It was social ideas, social practices, economic practices, uh, which were essentially taken over by the state. And you essentially said, we are standardizing it. And this process of standardization, BBPS, UPI, you name it, you, you're calling it infrastructure at the fundamental level. How, how is it nationalization that these are all private entities? See, you're, you're giving nominal control to the private sector. I'm not denying that. You're sharing all of this back to the private sector. And if you look at India's liberalization story, we built ports, the state builds ports, and then a businessman takes over. Okay? It is going to the private sector. There's no denying in that. But the state is building them. You call it infrastructure, you call them utilities, social or economic utilities. They're both, right? What we're missing in all of this is how it's being forced on us. I think that's the fundamental issue why most of us are here. And how the standardization of this is monopolized. That's exactly what Nikhil We never saying. discussed about the monopoly aspects of it. Like you're talking about duopoly Nikhil, to monopoly Nikhil from Nikhil a market Nikhil. point of view, right? But I'm talking about the standardization perspective itself. It's not, it's not phone pay. It's not visa. It's not MasterCard. It's iSpirit. People, I mean, you talk of any of the guys who are developing these protocols and standards, even for ONDC. Uh, you have the... I, Let me... I can I just add, I, it's one of the things that I also talk about. The fact yeah. is that if I'm running a UPI company, I can't choose my I can't choose my interface, I can't choose uh, my business model, I can't choose my so uh, I I can't even now choose my market share or I may not be able to in the future. Right? I can't fight for my market share because everything is exactly the point. Completely agree. I would actually disagree and I think uh, Mansi is also <laughs> getting to disagree because you know I don't think it is uh, uh, you know the state co-opting or uh, uh, making it sort of uh, a, a private idea into this thing it's it's connecting different private ideas so that more can happen I think what what we are missing here is that we are thinking from a lens we are not thinking the efficiency lens from a market point of view tech creates its own bubbles uh, unless you allow, there is, and there is some amount of friction that needs to be reduced if you need to reduce market power. For instance, with ABDM, right now, for instance, if you were going to a certain hospital, like for instance, for Fortis, and your record, medical records were all there, because India doesn't have a central repository or a way for medical records to be moved between hospitals. If you go to a new hospital, you will have to talk about your history. There is no way to get that information. But now, with the ABDM in between, your medical history can be, with your consent, moved. There are, of course, risks. This allows for competition between those two hospitals and for you to be able to move more easily. That is the economic benefit. The point is that I don't disagree with the fact that but there are risks. But do I get risks. to decide how no. the system's built? No, no. So I don't disagree with the fact that the entities that are deciding the standardizations, probably they need, they definitely need to be more transparent, open. They need to be more representative. But ultimately, standards have to be created by one entity. So if multiple people are creating standards, how will you do it? They're not standards anymore. Yeah. Then. Yeah, I mean, uh, how, how do you think the UPI will work if it doesn't have standards? I mean, how will operators get into the network? See, I, I, if you... What, are, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for yeah. intervening, but we can take this offline. 
we have run out of time. So one last question. Yes, sir. You in front. Uh, while the mic goes there, Kodali. Nikhil, no, no. Code is law. <laughs> code is law. Code is law. Same thing. That's yes. what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh, uh, wait. Yeah, I'm Sumit. Uh, yes. I'm a director at the Center for Competition and Economics. And I mean, because we're rethinking what quote unquote public is, I really think that we also need to rethink what quote unquote competition is, right? Because I think this is something which is used left, right and center. I mean, just to get the facts and law correct, it's an undefined term under Competition Act. Can we stand up? We say that, you know, ONDC yeah. is there. I mean, there Can is... you please stand up? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, what we really need to rethink is, I mean, what competition is. Because I think getting the law correct, I think it's an undefined term. That being said, I think we are saying that, you know, government is trying to regulate market. Government is also a player in the market, right? So I think the law is very clear that government is, I mean, publicly owned entities are also scrutinized under Competition Act. I think CC has done, has done some things correct. I mean, as much as most of the things not, is that in, in 14 years, they have regulated a couple of uh, government owned entities, Navratna companies. Recently, they passed an order again. Sorry, Ch you've lost me completely. No, I think what months I think what he's trying to say is that there's, so what is competition, that the metrics of what it means for a market to be competitive have changed. So does it mean in the context of, so digital markets uh, have now proven to be oligopolistic, right? So if you start defining competition in terms of market structure, whether there are two firms or three firms, is that how you want to look at uh, competition? Do you want to look at competition in terms of consumer welfare? Do you want to look at competition in terms of consumer choice? So those distinctions and those debates need to happen uh, before we get into do we have two players or three players. Uh, that's the that's one and second is obviously I think most of the things are hit and trial be it at the policy level or at an economic level when we say that we want to break monopoly in the X, X sector right, and we want to bring Y. Right, I think governments and business entities are trying right, we want to I, break. I just, have a, I just have a problem when there is a government backed entity in the middle that is picking winners hmm. like who gets first to roll out the first ONDC uh, marketplace, who gets to roll out the first uh, UPI app. Yeah. What's unsaid there is that it allows for a lot of lobbying to happen. So the yeah. more powerful players keep consolidating their power and then you really don't have fair play in any way. The hmm. choice is thrust upon consumers. Uh, players have, as Nikhil has explained a few times during the discussion, players have already reduced. Choice is thrust on consumers. Consumer welfare, nobody is looking at because there's monopoly or duopoly. And then what goes on? I think we can continue having yeah. this discussion for hours at end. Uh, but thank you so much, IFF. Thank you, all of you, for being here for this discussion. Thank you for the speakers. I know I kept on interrupting you, reminding you about time. But thank you so much for bearing with me. Uh, and on to the next session. <laughs>